Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our CEO Leadership Series. The series is all about adapting as we move together to safety, to safely manage the health and economy through crisis and now on to recovery. I'm Barb Lemieux, Executive Director of the New North, an 18-county economic development corporation in Northeast Wisconsin. New North is part of the Regional Leadership Council, made up of the leaders of the nine regional economic development organizations all across our state. The RLC serves as a key strategic partner to the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Our role is to provide strategic input and execution between our local businesses and stakeholders and the state to help us all compete on a global stage. We thank WDC for their support and leadership as we move through the pandemic and now on to recovery and rebuilding. And we also thank our local partners in their community rebuilding efforts. As you can see on the slide, the Regional Leadership Council is made up of the strategic partner organizations and executive directors from Visions Northwest, Momentum West, Seven Rivers Alliance, Prosperity Southwest, Grow North, Centergy, Madison Region, New North, and M7. One way we look at the crisis, recovery, and now new normal is through the eyes and interactions of the key partners across the state. Today, you will hear how government, healthcare, and business are working together to help us come out of this crisis stronger and in an even better position to compete globally. Now to moderate today's session, I am pleased to introduce Eric Johnson, Chairman of Aurora WDC, a world-recognized Wisconsin-based analytics, strategies, and facilitation company. With the help of insights from Aurora's global business engagements, the RLC is supporting and connecting our local businesses and partners with valuable data, analytics, and best practices adapting to our unique circumstances. So thank you, Eric, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Barb, much appreciated. We'll bring you back during the Q&A. Uh, good morning, everybody. We've got the final webinar in the plan series of the RLC webinars, uh, but there's a bit of a surprise for you all. Uh, we've decided to extend these through the summer. Uh, so we'll be back again. Uh, we're going to have a slight schedule change. We're going to be shifting these to Thursdays from Fridays, uh, same time, so 11 o'clock on Thursdays. Uh, and that's designed specifically to give you all a little easier time uh, starting your summer weekends early. Uh, if you're like me, you're feeling the weekend itch by 11 o'clock on Friday and don't feel like listening to a COVID-19 webinar. Um, so join us again. Uh, we're going to take the week off uh, next week and we'll be back on June 11th. So mark your calendars. You should get a reminder from the GoToWebinar system from us um, letting you know that the, the time has changed, or excuse me, the day has changed, time is the same. Uh, all of your links will continue to work, so whatever got you here now, use that again in order to come back on the 11th, and we hope to see you all back here again. Uh, please feel free to share and uh, spread the word on this. If you have colleagues or uh, friends or family that you want to have sit in on these, uh, this is really designed to be a statewide forum where uh, the economic development leaders of the state, uh, business, healthcare, and government can come together and really uh, figure this out. Uh, it's going to be a pretty long, hot, hot summer as the state economy starts to reopen. And as Barb alluded a second ago, uh, we've got some specific topics that we are going to want to um, dig into a little bit. Barb, I'm just going to turn off your webcam there just until uh, we come back for Q&A. Um, those three topics, and go ahead and advance the slide, please, Austin. Um, those three topics uh, are three that we're going to have our panelists dig into here today a little bit. Uh, we've got a tremendous panel of leaders, who, uh, some of whom you've heard of before and some who you haven't heard from before. Uh, and I hope to share all of their perspectives here with you today. Um, those three topics, specifically around the economic vitality of the state and the region and eventually our country, uh, really focus on a return to financial performance. When will our businesses and organizations return to a level of financial performance that they're more accustomed to a few months ago? Uh, secondarily, and it, it's not secondary, it's equal really, uh, the employment outlook. What will jobs look like uh, going forward? Uh, we've had a tremendous um, impact, obviously, to joblessness uh, here in Wisconsin and across the nation, around the world, really. And the uh, ability of us to get those people back to work doing something productive will be a very big part of uh, figuring this puzzle out. And last but not least, and really the one that I think is sort of first among equals, is consumer demand. Uh, when do we expect that the 70% of our economy, which is made up of consumers, 
when do we expect that those consumers will uh, come back and be behaving the way our businesses expected them to? Um, you notice that the title for this series is Adapt to Survive and Evolve to Thrive. Uh, and that's a really, really important point. And the one that if you take one thing away today, uh, the one message that we all have for you is that whatever you do in order to survive today, those adaptations that allow you to make it to tomorrow and eventually next week and next month, those adaptations will probably have to continue to recalibrate and evolve. Uh, ultimately, there are elements of your uh, organization and your operating posture which um, are going to go away. Uh, they won't be coming back uh, quite as you expected them to. Um, and that's the evolutionary part is you're going to have to figure out what elements uh, you're going to invest in in order to bring those things back in the way that matters most to your customers, to your people, uh, and ultimately to the stakeholders and shareholders who uh, are relying on your organization to sustain itself. So with that uh, introduction, I'd like to uh, bring on and reintroduce to you Dr. John Raymond, the president and CEO of the Medical College of Wisconsin. Uh, Dr. Raymond, welcome back. Uh, I think you've got the best bedside manner in the country, uh, in my opinion, and we'll love to hear uh, both your statistics for the week as well as uh, a little peek inside of MCW's operations and, and telling the rest of the state really what MCW is all about. So welcome back, sir. Thanks, Eric, and good morning, everybody. I'll start with a summary of COVID-19 indicators and trends, and then I will speak briefly about the impact of the pandemic on the Medical College of Wisconsin. This first slide covers COVID-19 diagnostic testing as of yesterday. Wisconsin's administered nearly 240,000 PCR tests for COVID-19, and of those, about 221,000 were negative, and about 17,000 were positive for a 7.1% positive rate. Of the positive tests, over 7,000 of those were administered in Milwaukee County. And our testing capacity continues to grow. It was up to 14,753 tests per day in Wisconsin as of yesterday, with 56 laboratories currently testing and 31 planning to test at some time in the near future. Positive tests of 10,114 were reported yesterday, and that was a new high. Wisconsin had 512 positive tests at a 4.8% positive rate yesterday, and the previous high was 599, which happened this Wednesday. I could go to the next slide to talk about some hospital metrics. Since early March, there have been 2,452 cumulative hospitalizations. And what that means is that if you test positive for COVID-19, there's a 14.4% chance that you'll be admitted to the hospital. And that rate has gone down significantly since the beginning of the pandemic when we were seeing rates of about 30%. I think part of that is the expanded use of testing for individuals that may not be quite as sick as the ones we were testing early on and the growing knowledge that we have about how to treat COVID-19. Now, current hospitalizations in Wisconsin as of yesterday were 408 inpatients, and that is trending up very slowly. The high was 446 on April 9th, and the recent low was 298 on May 6th. We had 138 patients in intensive care units yesterday, and that also was trending up very slowly. The high was 196 on April 9th, and the recent low was 91 on May 5th. We have plenty of ICU beds available, with 402 immediately available yesterday, and that number has been relatively stable. Our ICU and ventilator capacity have been stable and they've been consistently adequate over the last two months. And in terms of personal protective equipment, those also are stable to slightly improving with the most critical needs continuing to be for gowns and N95 masks. If I could have the next slide, please. This next slide covers a number of COVID-19 indicators. So far, Wisconsin's reported 550 COVID-19 related deaths. The daily death count was trending down slowly until Wednesday when we reported 22 deaths, which was a new high. And of all the reported deaths so far, 142 were in Black or African American individuals for 26%, 369 were white for 67%, and 49 were Hispanic or Latin for 9%. Now, anybody that does math will notice that the total exceeds 100% due to overlap between the Black, African-American, and the Hispanic and Latin categories. Our doubling times continue to slowly extend out now to 19.0 days. 
and the daily growth rates have been consistently under 5%. Now, this is a seven-day average, which was 2.9% yesterday. And the reproductive number, which is a measure of contagiousness in a particular geography at a particular time, was 1.13 yesterday. And what that means is, on average, an individual with COVID-19 is going to spread the disease to 1.1 other people. So we'd like to see that number be less than one. Next slide, please. This next slide shows trends since March 12th of daily positive tests on the left and deaths on the right. And the trends show increasing positive tests over time, but this also tracks very closely with the increased testing capacity that we have in the state. And as I mentioned earlier, the daily deaths shown on the right seem to be trending slowly downward until this last Wednesday when we had 22 reported deaths, which was our largest single day. Now, if you look there, there really isn't a clear trend at this point in time, and that bears some watching. Next slide, please. And I want to thank Eric for allowing me just a few minutes to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on MCW. I'm going to start with some background about MCW for those of you who might not be familiar with our institution. We were founded in 1893, and from 1913 to 1967, we were Marquette's medical school. We separated from Marquette due to financial reasons and nearly went bankrupt. And I want to thank the state of Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Medical Society, and the leadership of the Greater Milwaukee Committee in Milwaukee County for rescuing the institution so that we could have two medical schools in Wisconsin. Now, we moved to the Milwaukee Regional Medical Center in 1978, and that really was a milestone for us that enabled us to have spectacular growth since then. We're the fourth largest private medical school in the country, matriculating over 250 students per year and having a student body of nearly 1,000. Now, it's important to know we're freestanding and we don't own a health system and we're not owned by a health system. That's a very unusual structure. And we've educated or trained 50% of the physicians currently practicing in Wisconsin. And in 2015, we established two regional campuses, one in the Green Bay area and one in central Wisconsin. And I know Troy's coming next, but I do want to extend my gratitude to Troy Streckenbach for being a champion and an outstanding partner with us since 2013. So thank you, Troy. Now, we also be, uh, uh, opened a pharmacy school in 2017 and graduated our first class this last week. Uh, our main teaching health system partners in Milwaukee are Fratered Health, Children's Wisconsin, and the Zablocki VA Medical Center. And we provide the vast majority of specialty care at all three of those institutions. In central Wisconsin, our teaching partners are Aspirus and Ascension, and in northeastern Wisconsin, Bellin, the Hospital Sisters Health System, uh, the VA Medical Center, and Theta Care. Next slide, please. Now, MCW has the largest physician practice in Wisconsin with more than 2,000 providers. We also sponsor one of the 10 largest residency programs in the country with over 900 interns, residents, and fellows in over 100 specialty areas, uh, and they uh, serve in over a, two dozen hospitals in southeastern Wisconsin. And we've extended those residency programs to central Wisconsin and to northeastern Wisconsin over the last few years. What you may not know is we're also a top 100 research university in the country, and we're the second largest research enterprise in Wisconsin. And the economic impact just of our research enterprise is about $500 million per year. And we create 3,000 jobs in the southeastern Wisconsin region that are off of our campus. And that research enterprise allows us to bring talent and create jobs in the region. We're also the eighth largest employer in the Milwaukee region. And we have about $1.3 billion of annual revenues. And the vast majority of those come from our clinical practices. MCW, like all medical schools, has four missions. We teach, we do research, we provide patient care, and we're deeply committed to community engagement. And one thing that many people don't know is that our clinical mission is the only business line that we have that generates positive margin. It's, uh, it's a well-kept secret that we lose money on medical education, both undergraduate and graduate. That's normal for medical schools that we need to invest a, a vast amount of money in our research enterprise every year. It's anywhere between 70 and $100 million. And our clinical enterprise feeds those, uh, those other missions. Next slide, please. Now, this next slide summarizes the impact of COVID-19 on MCW and our response to COVID-19. Uh, 
we noticed in early January a troubling trend with the coronavirus in Wuhan, China at the time. And so we formed a COVID-19 task force in mid-January 2020 to do scenario, scenario planning for MCW and our four missions. And over that uh, period of time between January and March, we created the capacity um, to develop surge capacity within our Milwaukee hospital partners. And again, we staffed those hospitals. We converted thousands of physicians to work from home within 10 days in early March. We hibernated our laboratories and we have uh, thousands of people that do research at MCW and hundreds of laboratories that needed to be hibernated. And we converted all of our teaching to online and virtual. And this was a real challenge because much of our teaching experience happens in clinical settings. And our learners were excluded from teaching environments, mainly to preserve uh, personal protective equipment for frontline healthcare providers. So we had to learn quickly how to develop clinically relevant virtual experiences for our students so that they could graduate on time. And probably most importantly for people that think about business, we went from a very favorable financial performance for FY20 through the second week of March to a projected revenue loss of $120 million in a two week period of time in late March. So we had to aggressively remedy the financial challenge by suspending hiring and non-essential expenses, deferring some capital projects, we furloughed 700 individuals who still remain out on furlough, and we withheld all incentive pay, lowered base salaries, and that affected about 6,000 of our employees. And we also suspended our contributions to retirement plans. And that was really part of our short-term remedy. Um, and we're still in the remedy phase, but we're also simultaneously engaged in a three-step process of remedy, recovery, and reimagining. And I think those are similar to the concept that Eric was talking about, survive to thrive. And similar to many other businesses who are planning to reemerge from the crisis, we know that we're going to need to be a different organization going forward. And next slide, please. And this last slide simply shows an infographic that we use internally to help our leaders think beyond remedy and recovery and to engage in an ongoing process of reimagining how we can continue to support our missions of teaching, research, clinical care, and community engagement when we finally reach a new normal. And with that, I'd like to say thank you again to Eric and turn it back over to the moderator. Fascinating, doctor. You know, it feels like we've spoken almost daily for the last three months, and I had no idea the rich history and really the full breadth of the disruption you know, that you guys have experienced and the fact that you are still swinging after all of this. Um, really, really impressive story and one that I can't wait to see unfold. Um, you know, one of the principles that uh, I work in the strategy world and in, in our world, uh, we think about creative destruction. Um, and one of my own questions are, uh, what elements I think of healthcare do you expect to be created out of all this that just no one could have imagined or, or they were just completely unthinkable before this sort of thing happened. Yeah, it's great, great question, Eric, and shame on us if we don't reinvent ourselves. Um, I think probably the most important change in healthcare is going to be the, uh, the increasing use of telehealth and virtual visits. And some of the barriers to those that uh, prevented us from implementing them before really had to do with reimbursement and documentation of, of the visits. And I have to say that the federal government really led the way here by providing enhanced reimbursements for these virtual visits that were on par with the face-to-face -face visits that we had before that the insurance companies followed very quickly. Um, but what's also been surprising and is going to be a challenge for us going forward is how frightened people are about coming back to get normal care in the COVID environment. And that's something that we're working very hard uh, to try to restore the faith of people that they can safely come back and get routine medical care. Wow, indeed. Well, we have to keep moving. I have a couple of questions from the audience for you, doctor. And one quick question, can you stay with us for the duration? Or are you gonna be here for the hour or do you have to run? I'll be here for the hour. Oh, thank you so much, so much. Thanks, so man. Mary asked a question, I think about the arithmetics uh, behind some of the uh, stats that you shared, doctor. Uh, if someone tests positive for antibodies, is that considered a positive test for COVID-19 and reported in the new daily numbers? No, um, we, don't, we don't mix the serology tests with the diagnostic tests, the PCR tests that measures an active infection. 
Very good. Great, great uh, question because we know some other states have been mixing those two metrics. Um, one other question that I had, I was reading about a county in California, Lassen County, uh, which had zero confirmed cases up until a couple of days ago, and they had been one of the first counties to reopen in California. They have now locked down again. Uh, what are your expectations over the summer? Is, is there any way we can have any sort of expectations about what the summer will bring? Well, COVID-19 COVID doesn't respect county borders and it can be spread when people are asymptomatic. So I think if we want to avoid having to have other shutdowns, people need to practice social distancing, good hand hygiene, and wear cloth face coverings to protect other people from your respiratory droplets. Uh, those are the most important things that we can do. And I think um, they're courteous and the responsible things to do. Very well said, doctor. Thank you again. Uh, and we have a quick poll question. This is gonna be the third time we've asked this poll question of you all. Uh, and I'm gonna throw it up on the screen right now. And if you guys can vote on this poll, we'll get on with our show uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, the question is around financial performance. And uh, it doesn't matter if you work in a business or you work in some sort of other organization, uh, your organization has expectations about getting back to uh, what you used to enjoy in terms of financial performance. So I'd like you to answer the question, how long will it take for your organization to return to its pre-pandemic financial performance? Do you think it'll be less than a year? Will it be more than a year, but less than three? Will it be more than three years? Will you never get back uh, to pre-pandemic financial performance or you don't know? Uh, we've got about 35% of you have voted. Uh, when that starts to plateau, I'm gonna close the poll and show you the results. Uh, we see some pretty optimistic uh, folks in our audience today. Uh, we're at about 50% and the pessimists have not overtaken the optimists yet. So with about 60% voted, uh, most of you, two thirds of you think it'll take between one and three years to get back there. And about a quarter of you think it'll happen much faster than that. So uh, we'll keep rolling. Troy, uh, I'm gonna ask you to come on. Troy Streckenbach, I'm going to unmute you here so that we can hear you as well. Uh, and Troy, you're next on our list of guests today. Take it away. Well, good afternoon, Eric, and thank you for the opportunity to present uh, what's happening up here in Brown County, Northeast Wisconsin. And our our ability to you know navigate um, what I think is probably the biggest challenge is, is creating certainty. And I think when you see the polls or you, you see what um, you know businesses or families are trying to do to navigate the uncertainty, they're looking for they're looking for certainty. Um, and what we've experienced over the course of the last uh, two months has been, uh, I would say some rough seas. And what we're trying to do up here in Brown County is, recognize what the current uh, scenarios are, and then trying to build confidence in the consumer that they can go back into the, the economy and do it safely. Because we all know, and we're all seeing the stories um, that you know there are businesses that are going out of business. And, uh, and one of the best ways for us to get back to business is by following some plans. Um, so <clears throat> quickly, I'm gonna, walk through just some of the things that have happened here in Brown County, uh, you know, the kind of our journey that we've taken, and then ultimately leading on to what we're trying to provide the businesses in this community, and then how we're trying to build the consumer confidence uh, by patronizing those businesses. So next slide, please. Um, as we all witness and we all realize that um, at first the governor and Secretary Palm placed the safer at home, uh, which essentially basically told certain businesses that are essential critical infrastructure, please continue to operate, but do it under these circumstances. And then the businesses that were not considered essential, they would have to cease operations. And we all saw what that had, that had done to our economy. Uh, what it did to certain businesses. And we all saw the different debates that were taking place, uh, you know, from the individuals who supported it to the individuals who didn't support it. And obviously we had the uh, challenge that um, uh, was ultimately overturned by the state Supreme Court on May 13th, which basically stated that the Safer at Home 
uh, order was unconstitutional and that all businesses are reopened. I, I just want to quickly pause here to talk about how uncertainty uh, creates uh, chaos. And so here in Brown County, we were trying to um, address what do we do next? Uh, we were all waiting for the state to come out with guidelines, um, kind of everybody knowing that the state Supreme Court was going to be ruling on this at some point. Uh, we were hoping that the state would provide some general guidelines that how businesses should operate, how government should operate. In absence of that, um, we began the process of uh, looking to our state and federal guidelines that were created by the CDC and WDC as the means for businesses, because quickly businesses were asking us, hey, we want to be able to open safely. We want to do it in a manner that uh, both protects our, 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 our employees and also our, um, um, our customers. Um, and so we started to point them to CDC and WDC guidelines because in the end, uh, that was right now at the time what was available and what was the guiding principles over the Badger Bounce Back Plan. Next slide, please. Um, as we experienced the discussions uh, with our local businesses, we were learning slowly that um, every business sector or industry or individual business, uh, as they were reading through the guidelines, the WEDC guidelines and the CDC guidelines are very well put together, uh, but businesses were having individual questions. Next slide. Uh, about how does this relate to their business. And so we actually began a journey uh, meeting with uh, individuals from the different industries up here in Brown County and asking them to go through the CDC and WDC guidelines and then asking us questions, particularly what does it mean to their business? How do we actually adapt and adapt to these recommendations to make sure that we're following the safer at home uh, order, even though it's not in place, um, as far as businesses reopening. Next slide, please. And so during that process, we then started to create uh, our own reopening guide. Um, in the meantime, though, we were working with our Greater Green Bay Chamber of Commerce, New North, New Manufacturing Alliance, the, uh, the Restaurant Association, the Tavern League, a number of the different organizations and associations uh, in Brown County to create uh, these guidelines. In the same time, we had, uh, you know, the businesses like the city of De Pere, they put together a small business pandemic loan. City of Green Bay put together a COVID grant program. The, the Greater Green Bay Chamber of Commerce uh, put together, I think they're over $300,000 available for small businesses, Nicolet Bank. And so you saw the, the community kind of coming together to put together some packages available for businesses who perhaps didn't receive the PPP loan or they didn't receive the disaster loan and were struggling to uh, make ends meet. Next slide, please. As part of the overall process in reopening um, Brown County, what we did is we held a town hall meeting. We had roughly, uh, I know that we were over 250 participants at one point, and this was a five hour uh, seminar or a town hall meeting that public health held where businesses could come on and come off depending on what time frame they were working on their specific industry, and they were able to ask questions. Uh, we, the feedback we received from the business community and the people who participated in this was uh, very favorable and they looked for us to have continued uh, um, uh, events into the future as we roll out new sectors and uh, new uh, recommendations for, for businesses to reopen. Next slide, please. And last week we, re we introduced uh, the reopening Brown County guidance. Uh, it's the uh, planning document that kind of, as I just walked through, where we met with all the different uh, sectors in Brown County and provided them with some guidance on how do they interpret it, the CDC guidelines, the WDC guidelines. Um, I know that from a food industry standpoint, you have 
what the health department, Brown County Health Department, you know, licenses and inspects the food establishments, they have certain criteria and regulations for just the foodborne uh, diseases and viral, you know, um, aspects of uh, cleansing and cleansiness. The COVID obviously is another different type of uh, requirements for businesses to operate and the two are not equal. So a lot of questions that we had from the food industry uh, sector. And so what we did is we dug into that and we created some guidelines to help them better navigate it. Next slide, please. And as part of that, we, we realized that moving on to the, the aspect of our economy and realizing that 70% of the population right now still is a little bit hesitant to re-engage the, you know, the economy. And one of the things that we know is critical is if we are not able to get the economy back up and running, uh, we're gonna continue to see uh, areas in Brown County government where we're overseeing is mental health. Uh, you know, some of the, the, the suicides that are taking place we know that we need to get things back running to a, a, a standard where people can feel comfortable and confident. One of that is, is, of course, getting the economy running. And so what we suggested was that businesses, if they were willing to adopt and implement the Brown County Reopening Guide, that they would then place these posters in their windows and then allow us to, um, you know, push out through social media or holding press conferences, notifying the public that this business has adopted some of our standards or the standards that we have uh, provided for their industry and that you should feel safe coming into this establishment as a consumer uh, because they're implementing this. So building uh, and creating standards for consumer confidence is gonna be critical for our economy overall to get back and running. And so that was one of the, uh, you know, as we look at the different phases, we had the safer at home phase. Right now we're in the reopening phase. We're all hoping up here that we're not in the eye of the storm. As you heard Dr. Raymond speak about, you know, what, what are the, what's, what's happening currently or what can businesses, what can the residents the, do in the area? Well, the number one thing is continue to listen to the healthcare providers. Uh, they're the ones that I, I would say that they're professionals, they're at the experts who are giving us the best advice, to make sure that we can, uh, you know, make it through this and be resilient and adapt. And one of the best ways for us to do that, because we currently do not have a vaccine uh, or the proper medications at this point, is to continue to follow the social distancing, uh, follow the different guidelines that are being provided, and hopefully, by, you know, if People are projecting September, October, November, somewhere around that time frame. we may have a resurgence. The best way for us to do, to avoid that is by continuing to follow the social distancing guidelines, washing our hands, not touching our face, wearing the mask, all those are key components. Um, and as long as businesses continue to adopt and to maintain some type of level of standards that are uh, provided through guidelines that are following the CDC to WDC guidelines, we should be able to make it through this. And I, and I, I firmly believe that uh, the Wisconsin uh, forward idea will, will come out of this stronger. Um, I think businesses will, uh, will adapt. We, you know, um, I, telehealth, rural broadband, distant learning, all those things are at the forefront of current discussions. And we'll certainly as a state need to continue to make certain investments to make sure that uh, we're prepared for these type of things to happen into the future. Um, and so that concludes my remarks, Eric, um, and I'm ready for some questions. Thank you, Troy, that was really, really great. Uh, you know, I my own questions about Brown County um, revolve around, I think that most famous institution in your city, the Green Bay Packers. And uh, I know they're a major uh, impact on your local economy there from a tourism and entertainment uh, but uh, but all of hospitality, really. Um, do you have any expectations about the Packers season coming up and, and all of that stuff? And I understand if you can't comment on it, that's a pretty big question. Troy, are you still there? Did you hear me? I think we lost Troy there for a second. All right. 
Well, uh, Troy, if you make it back, I'm, I've got a zinger of a question for you about uh, the Packers. So uh, sorry about that. Uh, I have a poll question that I'm going to be bringing up here in a second. Uh, second poll question, and this one is actually, I'm sorry you're going to miss this, Troy. Hopefully you'll make it back during the poll question. Uh, this one has to do with your own consumption habits as a household. How long will it take for your household to return to its pre-pandemic spending and consumption habits? Um, I understand that's a pretty abstract question to be asking, but we've asked it twice before. Uh, last week, we'll, uh, I'll share some of the stats that last week um, shared, but uh, we'll uh, leave the poll open here for another few seconds so that a few more of you can get your votes in. Again, a pretty optimistic uh, crowd out there with a couple of not very optimistic folks passing their votes along. We're at about 32% right now. So go ahead and get your votes in. I'm going to close that poll in five, four, three, two, one. And with about 60% voted, we have a 57%, believe it'll return in less than a year, 28% between one and three years. So that works out to about 87%, 89%, something like that. Uh, some of you do feel, though, that your spending will never return, and that's uh, that's something to take very seriously. So uh, thank you very much for those poll uh, inputs. I'm going to hide those results and bring on Tamis Houlihan. Uh, Tamas is the um, executive director at the Wisconsin Potato and Vegetable Growers Association. And Tamas is going to tell us a little bit about um, how the folks who grow our food uh, around the state are uh, adapting to survive and evolving to thrive. Before you take over, Tamas, I just want to remind the audience, please get those questions in. Although we lost Troy there, I think, for a second, uh, hopefully he's able to get back in. And I can ask one of my uh, one of my other producers to get in touch with him and try and help him back on. Uh, but uh, get those questions in. We will have time at the end to ask those questions. Uh, and there is a chat panel as well. Uh, and you can feel free to chat in there. And then the handouts, uh, I've been asked about the handouts and whether they're available for download. All of you should see a handouts pane in your GoToWebinar control panel where you can grab the PDF uh, of that. So without further delay, Tamas, please take us away with your remarks. Thank you, Eric. Uh, yes, I am the executive director for the Wisconsin Potato and Vegetable Growers Association. And just for those of you who aren't familiar with our organization, um, we represent 110 farms that primarily raise potatoes. Uh, all our farms do raise some alternative crops uh, uh, to work in rotation with potatoes. And so we are a big producer of snap beans, peas, sweet corn, carrots, onions, as well as potatoes. But our organization is funded through an assessment on potato production and potato sales. And Wisconsin typically ranks third in the United States in terms of potato production. Uh, we rank um, behind Idaho, which is the nation's largest producer of potatoes, and Washington State is the second largest. And there are about a dozen states that are considered major potato producing states in the US. The Wisconsin crop breakdown is about 45% fresh market or table stock potatoes. Those are the potatoes that you find in the grocery store. Um, about 25% of our production goes for chipping potatoes. We have the largest Frito-Lay supplier in the nation right in central Wisconsin in Heartland Farms. Um, about 20% of our production goes to uh, the McCain Foods factory in Plover, Wisconsin. And that, uh, they turn those potatoes into frozen products like French fries, hash browns, tater tots. They have a, a whole line of specialty products. They've got potato smiles um, and some other items as well. And then 10% the of the Wisconsin potato production is dedicated to seed potatoes, which are very similar to a, a normal uh, potato for consumption, but they follow strict uh, disease control methods and uh, their farms are highly sanitized to make sure those seed potatoes produce a really good resulting crop. So in Wisconsin, uh, the big news came on March 13th. Our growers agreed to terms on the 2020 and 2021 crop year potato contracts with McCain Foods. And that same day, 
McCain, you know, they're pleased that we came to agreement on the contract terms, but they announced that they would not be able to offer any contracts until they determined the impacts of COVID-19 on their business. And McCain is a worldwide company. Um, they have factories all over the U.S. and in Canada, um, as well as throughout the world. And so a little later, uh, about a month later, we learned that the Wisconsin contracts were going to be cut 25% in volume. Um, they didn't try to change any of the terms that we had agreed to on price, uh, which was really good to hear for our growers. But a 25% cut in volume is very significant. Um, but again, if you remember the breakdown of the Wisconsin crop, only about 20% of the Wisconsin potato crop goes to frozen processing, which is basically all McCain foods. And so the 25% cut in that portion of our business represented about 1.2 to 1.5 million hundredweight of potatoes and so that translates to a 12 to 15 million dollar loss uh, potatoes uh, in general are sold for about ten dollars a hundredweight and that's what that contract would have paid on those 12 to 15 million uh, hundredweight so uh, the immediate problem, however, was the huge piles of potatoes that were in storage, both at McCain and in grower storages from the 2019 crop. Um, potatoes are stored almost year round nowadays in, in very sophisticated storage buildings that have cool temperatures and very high humidity to keep the potatoes as good as possible for processing throughout the year. Um, there was also a, a huge amount of frozen product that was in the pipeline. And with the closure of schools and restaurants and the reduced business at hotels, the food service business basically fell off a cliff when COVID hit. Um, and so there was a huge um, reduction in demand for all these products, all the frozen products that were going to restaurants, hotels, schools, et cetera as well as the large carton sized uh, fresh potatoes that are used for baking. And so we had about half a million hundredweight of potatoes that were still in storage from the 2019 crop that had to be dealt with. And fortunately, Wisconsin has a very robust fresh market and we could turn some of those potatoes over to the fresh market. And so a lot of the potatoes that the growers were holding in storage for McCain um, were diverted to fresh market. They were run through packaging sheds, they were put in bags and they were sold at the grocery stores because the retail demand increased tremendously with the advent of COVID. Grocery store sales were through the roof. People were stocking up and they weren't buying the usual five and 10 pound bags. They were, they were buying as much as they could. <laughs> Um, it was almost a hoarding situation and, and potatoes were being purchased uh, rapidly. And so Wisconsin is very well set up to handle that. We even had one packing shed that had finished for the year uh, reopen and buy up some of these potatoes that were going to be going to the frozen process market. Instead, they got packaged in bags and sold to grocery stores on the retail market. So that was a good thing. Um, the real unfortunate part of this whole uh, potato uh, problem with COVID lies in the states out west. Uh, Washington state is 90% food service uh, potato production. Idaho is 50% of their production goes to food service. And uh, Oregon is heavy into food service. And so when those states uh, saw the closure of the food service market, uh, the, they're in trouble. Um, some of them had already planted their potatoes for this coming year, and then they were told by these processors, you're cut 100%. We just don't have a home for your potatoes. And so the, the growers out west are really in dire straits, and we've been working closely with our National Potato Council on some of these uh, CARES Act uh, food programs. They've given away a lot of potatoes, donated them to food banks, food pantries, as well as worked closely with their federal officials on getting some funding to get these these potatoes uh, a home, basically. Um, and so some growers were told in time that they could cancel their seed orders and not plant these potatoes that are no longer going to be needed. But then those seed growers were stuck with product that had no home. 
And so the situation out west is very dire. I'll just leave it at that. Wisconsin, uh, not so bad. Um, the real problem, though, could come this fall. Uh, the vast majority of potatoes in the United States are harvested in September and October. And when we harvest all these potatoes, um, and if there isn't enough of a rebound in the food service market, there will be a massive oversupply situation in the fall. And so we're very concerned about that because that will spill over and affect the Wisconsin growers. Um, it's a very supply demand market in the potato industry. And when supply exceeds demand, the price drops. And in a lot of cases, the growers will receive less money than it costs to raise the crop. And so when you're returning below the cost of production, you can't stay solvent for very long. Um, it's going to be more of an issue out west, as I've stated a couple of times now, but uh, the fresh market could be problematic for Wisconsin in the fall as well. The good news is that the food service market is rebounding rapidly, even as we speak with all the restaurants uh, reopening, hotel business is increasing, and the quick serve restaurants, which is uh, a huge sector of our industry, have stayed open. The drive through sales and, and curbside and delivery, all those things have helped uh, with, with the food service market. And so we've seen reports that show, you know, Wendy's restaurants, their sales were only down 2% um, for the week ending May 2nd. That's amazing when you consider the fact that people aren't able to go into the restaurants and sit down and eat. Um, it speaks to the fact that people who would normally be going to a restaurant are probably still driving through and picking up their food. Uh, McDonald's is only down 11% in sales nationwide uh, in, a, in a recent week. And so to see those kinds of numbers is really encouraging for the potato industry. Um, and so as you know, restaurants, hotels, schools reopen and return to normal business levels, I'm very confident that our industry will recover. Um, we were really headed in a positive direction at the beginning of 2020. I mean, especially these frozen products at, at our processors, the french fries, the hash browns, the tater tots, were really increasing in consumption. Um, the processors were talking about expanding, they were building new factories, um, they were building additions to factories, and all that got put on hold in March. Um, but they had talked to uh, our growers in Wisconsin about increasing 20 to 30% production over the next two years before COVID hit. And so it'll be a while before we return to those levels. But um, another silver lining in all of this is at home consumption has increased tremendously in the last couple of months, obviously. Um, but as more and more people prepare potatoes at home, um, as well as the canned vegetable and frozen vegetable sector of our industry, the more that people get used to eating those things at home, the more we think that trend will continue. Um, potatoes are an inexpensive vegetable. They're extremely versatile. I mean, just think about all the ways you could prepare potatoes, boiled, made, baked, mashed, fried, potato salad, scallop potatoes. Um, and so, they're very convenient. I mean, nowadays you can pop them in a microwave and, and have a potato basically ready to eat in five minutes. And so the same is true with these canned and frozen veggies. Uh, those were on a steady decline in consumption. Um, peas, beans, sweet corn, they were all declining over the last 20 years. All of a sudden they have gone up tremendously in the last two months. And we hope that as people eat those at home, they will start to say, hey, you know what? These are inexpensive and they're really good. And so with that, I can kind of kind of shut up. Um, I didn't touch on all the things that are related to COVID, like the job market and, and the overall economy, but um, I think we're gonna rebound very rapidly and Wisconsin's in a good place. Really fascinating, Tannis. Uh, you know, as a lover of French fries and tater tots and all of those delicious comfort foods that make us feel a little less anxious uh, in times like these. Um, you've got an important mission out there, my friend, uh, making sure that that supply 
uh, that supply chain maintains itself. I'm going to come back to you for questions, Tamas, uh, in the interest of time. And I'm going to ask uh, Giacomo Faluca to please come on from uh, the uh, Palermo Pizzas. Uh, he's the grandson of the founder. And Giacomo, uh, the stage is yours. Tell us what you uh, tell us about your company and uh, and how you're adapting and evolving. Um, well, hello, um, Eric and everyone. Uh, thanks for having me on today. Um, Palermo, we are a frozen pizza manufacturer located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, in the Menominee Valley, and uh, we employ um, close to 700 employees between manufacturing sales. Um, the Palermo brands, um, um, we call it a family of brands. Uh, the Palermo brand, um, we also manufacture all the Screaming Sicilian, that's our brand. Um, Connie's Frozen Pizza and Urban Pie. Uh, our company also is a major supplier to many of the nation's uh, leading retailers um, in their own brand of, of frozen pizzas. And so um, uh, we sell our products uh, throughout the, uh, of course, Wisconsin and throughout the US and Canada and some other countries as well. Um, we have um, been manufacturing frozen pizza since uh, 1979, and the company started in 1964 as a small Italian bakery and then a restaurant, and that just gives you a little bit um, about our history. So um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about um, the current state of, of um, frozen pizza manufacturing and um, the recent uh, suspension of our plant uh, due to some of the COVID outbreaks. And so um, so before I talk about that, Palermo is a USGA facility. Um, we have an inspector on site um, every single shift uh, that we produce. And, um, and so all of our products and labels are uh, <clears throat> monitored and um, inspected by the USDA um, locally as well as out of um, Washington, D.C. Um, it's, really it's really considered to be um, um, the Department of Consumer Protection to ensure that uh, what we make is um, considered to be uh, of the quality we expect and um, um, food safety is um, you know, our primary purpose in um in all the inspections so um we um um back in um may uh when the COVID outbreak hit and i'll talk about this specific situation and um and perhaps some of, of the listeners can learn from that um we um uh, the city of milwaukee health department um there is a, a state um the state law basically says that um, um, any po um, two positive COVID tests uh, are considered an outbreak. Um, and Milwaukee, Milwaukee, Milwaukee County, they consider that to be the situation. And so um, we had to suspend our operations after we had five positives. And of those five positives, one employee was already back to work. So um, it was quite a surprising situation because we thought, my goodness, um, two positive constitutes an outbreak. And that does give the city of Milwaukee the authority to ask the plant to suspend their production. And so um, that occurred in, um, um, in early May. And so we, um, we were given notice on a Friday afternoon, um, and we had been communicating with the health department probably um, that entire week or two because we, our HR department has been very um, uh, diligent in terms of recording the cases and um, the contract tra tracing. And I'll, I'll tell you about some of the mitigation that we're doing later on. Um, and so we are communicating with the Milwaukee Health Department but did not realize that that two was the number. And so when it hit five, um, they felt that um, they needed to contain it. And so what we did is we closed the plant for 48 hours. We submitted a mitigation plan to the city of Milwaukee 
And it was a binder that was about four inches thick because we are a USDA facility. We do have outside companies that audit us, third party audits. Um, so this is not something that we were not used to. Um, but the larger task was then to, um, we had to test every single employee um, prior to restarting the, the plant, you know, which was monumental in itself. I mean, we, um, so the city of Milwaukee works with uh, Wisconsin National Guard. <clears throat> so we were told on a Friday, um, by Sunday, the National Guard was into our facility to survey um, the layout. And um, we have, a, um, our facility is rather large and um, uh, we have like 13 acres. So we had enough space outside of our facility to coordinate the testing of um, over 500 employees. There's about 560 actually that we tested. And so um, Monday morning, um, we were able to get our employees to come in. It was a drive through, you know, similar to what Wisconsin National Guard is doing. They were able to test our employees and we, we completed that in one day. Um, the sheer volume, I think, just created some delays in um, whether or not an employee tested positive or negative, who was able to come back to work, um, because it went from the Milwaukee testing to a lab in Madison. And then, of course, um, um, the employees had to be notified. We had to be notified and then um, uh, assign them back to work. So we lost about a week's worth of production, which is pretty significant um, due to the heavy demand right now because of stay at home, um, frozen pizzas, uh, uh, Thomas, like French fries are in high demand. Um, so, um, so that was quite a setback, but, um, it, there was, there was certainly quite a bit of learning and I'd be happy to share that, uh, with any of you that want to contact me separately to talk about what we learned and, and what we, um, found out about the laws and, um, what it means, um, and how to, um, either prevent, avoid, or deal with a plant shutdown. So, um, I will tell you as part of our mitigation plan, prior to um, the suspension of our plant, uh, we had a COVID-19 team. We met each day. Um, we talked about um, the, the health and safety of our manufacturing employees. Only a handful of office folks of the 150 or so um, were in the office. But there were most of the office and admin were working from home. But the focus was on the manufacturing employees. So um, because we are a USDA facility, um, there are many standards that we adhere to already um, as it relates to um, uh, hairnets, gloves, uh, eyewear, ear protection, and um, um, the robing and disrobing of their smocks and all of their uh, equipment, um, the special shoes they wear, we have, uh, you know, we have sanitizers and disinfectants that get sprayed on their feet as they enter into the plant. Our plant is refrigerated at 45 degrees, so it's a cold environment, a chilled environment, actually. Um, but some of the things we did is we, um, and I, I should say that Palermo, we're a relatively highly automated manufacturing facility. We, uh, we have three um, um, topping lines and uh, two bakeries. And I can tell you that our topping lines, the, the, we were, our employees are probably because of the automation, um, in most cases, 10 to 12 feet apart. Um, and the automation of the packaging, where it's rare that an employee touches a package, all the way through the product being cased, boxed, and um, uh, palletized and into the freezer. So lots of automation, a lot of uh, social distancing already um, just because of our operation. And, um, and so, but we installed things, uh, we put into place our um, uh, thermometers, our, our heat scanners that when an employee does enter, um, they pass through a thermometer. It, it can, you know, uh, temperature check about a hundred employees, uh, you know, for every, um, uh, every few minutes, it's very, very fast. Um, all of the face protection, we have um, not only the masks that we provide, but we have the uh, plexi shields that go over their face 
in the case where there are few employees um, that um, um, where there'll be few employees that'll be closer to one another, uh, but that's a rare situation. And um, and so that that the thermometers apply to the plant as well as um, as the office. And one of the things that we are um, beginning in mid June, and this is uh, an investment we decided to make. Um, on behalf of the um, health and safety of our employees is that we are going to um, do what we call cycle testing, but we're gonna we're going to do COVID testing on every single employee every 14 days. And what this will do is um, um, it's preventive, of course, but it does a couple of things. Number one, it lets us know that if anyone is asymptomatic, uh, and by the way, uh, we have a, a process in which uh, all employees enter in terms of temperature checks and how they're feeling. Um, Palermo, um, we're, we're really vigilant about employees staying home. If they're not feeling well, um, they will get paid. Um, so, they're, so there's an incentive, so to speak, to stay home and only to be working if you're healthy. Of course, the quarantine folks and anyone testing positive, um, when they're at home, they'll be fully paid for their time. Um, so. But I think the, the ongoing testing, while it's an investment, is really an important step in uh, prevention as well, so that we know that the, the workforce at large um, that is at Palermo is, um, is without symptoms. It doesn't mean they can't contract it days after. It doesn't prevent it. But it allows us to, to um, um, have employees uh, quarantine at home um and then uh, not be involved in the uh, community as well so Giacomo, that's uh so eric here again that really fascinating to hear how you're really um you know erring on the side of caution i think and just being really diligent in making sure that your people are uh you know there's no chance that you've got someone who's sick in your manufacturing operation mm -hmm. well there's always a chance but the, the point is that every 14 days we can't prevent what happens outside, but we do send employees home with kits. We have Safer at Home, we have a Safer at Home initiative. So every employee um, that does carpool, they have a carpool kit that includes sanitizers and masks and ways to keep um, their at home as safe as possible. Right, awesome. I'm gonna uh, pop our third poll up here and we're gonna have time for just a couple of questions. We're over time already, everybody, so apologies about that. Uh, let's have the rest of the panel come back on camera and I'm gonna run our third poll with our audience. Thank you, Giacomo, so much for those remarks. Um, how long will it take for the jobs that have been lost in the past few months to return to pre-pandemic levels? And again, same options for answers here. And uh, we've got about 200 of you left uh, with us here right now. As many as uh, can, please vote on this. Uh, it's gonna be less than a year. It's gonna be more than a year, but less than three. Is it going to be more than three years? Do you think they'll ever return or you're not sure? Uh, and go ahead and get those votes in now while our panel's coming back on screen. I'm going to share a couple of remarks while that's happening regarding uh, what we're doing going forward here. Uh, remember that we're not meeting next week. We're going to meet the second Thursday in June. It'll be June 11th at 11 o'clock. Uh, you will get a reminder email from our system to come back then and to uh, rejoin us once again. Uh, but with about five seconds left before I close the poll, uh, we'll have our kind of closing remarks and a final question or two. So uh, poll results are uh, more than a year, less than three years was over half of you. And many of you think it'll take uh, more than three years. About 20% of you think it'll take more than three years to come back. Uh, when we come back uh, from our little break next week, we will have a longitudinal comparison of those numbers over the last three weeks. We've been collecting those numbers for three weeks now, uh, and we will be able to do a little bit of a comparison between what we saw earlier and today. Um, Barb, I'm going to ask you to come back on too and unmute you. Um, I'm going to unmute Tamis as well, and hopefully you guys are all back. Troy, thanks for coming back. Uh, sorry you had a little interruption on the technology side there. Um, but uh, the, the question I've got for you all, I think, and there's Dr. Raymond back as well. Uh, the one question that I think a lot of people uh, are wondering is, 
Uh, what do you expect for the summer? I mean, we've got a, a big summer season here. It's a major, major time of tourism and uh, vacationing here in Wisconsin. Troy, I think just before you got cut off, I was going to ask you about the Packers season and all sorts of zingers about how what to expect there. Uh, but obviously, you guys have given us some really tremendous examples today of how you've adapted to make it through this and that you're evolving your operation in order to really thrive tomorrow. Any, anyone have any thoughts about what the summer holds? I can tell you that for farmers, it's been business as usual, even through March, April, and May. I mean, they're essential workers. And uh, it kind of bothers me from time to time when I see all the, the kudos going out to our frontline health officials. I love that. I mean, they deserve it, but no one seems to mention the farmers. Man, those guys are out there doing extremely important work for our country, and they haven't changed a thing. I mean, they're out there working every day. And so from their perspective, uh, there might even be a bigger pool of available workers now with, with people being laid off in other positions and they constantly need help with labor. And so, you know, it's not as bad as it could be uh, for farming. Yep. Thank you, Thomas. Anybody else? Well, I'd just like to say what's going to happen here in Wisconsin will depend on individual choices. I know people are fatigued from lockdown and that the issues of masking has been politicized, but I would just encourage everybody, if we want to have a good, stable, safe summer and a return of our economy, people should be wearing masks when uh, when they're interacting with other people outside their home. Very well said, doctor. Well, I don't know that there's a better way to end uh, than with that advice. And uh, stay on here, guys, while I kind of take us out. Uh, just one more time, a big thank you to all of our panelists today, Dr. Raymond, County Executive Streckenbach, uh, Tomas, and Giacomo. Thanks to you, Barb, for kicking us off here uh, this morning. Uh, if your company is in need of a business, uh, business assistance, the Regional Leadership Council's nine regional economic development organizations across Wisconsin are ready and available to help you. You can see the contact information for each of the organizations uh, highlighted in the last slide. If we could go back to that one, Austin, please. Uh, you can also download the slides with all of that information from our handout section in the control panel. So you've got that uh, locally available to you. Um, be sure to share uh, that you were here for this webinar and share the link to register uh, going forward on your, uh, forward on your social media. Uh, a recording will be published uh, later today of the playback for this. Uh, and a reminder that our next webinar is going to be on the uh, Thursday, June 11th, 11 o'clock. We're going to be taking off next week, and then we're moving it up to Thursdays for the summer. Uh, and uh, once again, thank you for all of you who've stayed past the top of the hour. We really appreciate your patience. Uh, we got a ton of wisdom, I think, from our fantastic panel. Uh, Giacomo, Troy, Thomas, uh, Tomas, and Barb, and, and Dr. Raymond, thank you guys again for being here and, and being a part of this. Uh, we'll see you uh, as soon as we can. And, and Dr. Raymond, I hope to see at least you back here on the 11th. Thanks, Eric. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you. Okay. See ya.